Welcome. We are delighted to present this series of educational videos, Pituitary 101, featuring Dr. Louis Blevins, a program exclusively produced by Pituitary World News with important information about the systems that drive pituitary function and, importantly, how those systems are affected by pituitary disease. Here's Dr. Blevins. Oh, hello. I'm Dr. Lewis Blevins of Pituitary World News. Welcome to Episode 1 of Pituitary 101. This is a series of short videos where we'll cover pituitary anatomy and physiology and laboratory testing. I'd like to say it's how your pituitary works and how I test its function. Let's start with a review of the anatomy and physiology of the hypothalamic pituitary unit. You can see on this slide, uh, that's a schematic rendered by an artist, the hypothalamic pituitary unit. Between the hypothalamus and the pituitary here is the pituitary stalk. This is a very important highway for traffic between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. This unit works very closely together with uh, the brain to measure hormone levels in the bloodstream and alter those levels depending on your needs as a living organism. The hypothalamus up here contains nerve cell bodies or neuron cell bodies that collectively form what we call nuclei, and I'll show you a slide of that in a moment. Uh, but the bottom line is these, these nervous tissues release releasing hormones, or uh, so used to be called releasing factors, now we call them hormones, into the circulation of this hypothalamic pituitary unit, and those releasing hormones are carried to the pituitary through these portal vessels to the anterior pituitary gland where they find target receptors on the cells of the pituitary and affect pituitary function, which leads then to the pituitary to affect the uh, different function of glands throughout the, and tissues throughout the body. And we'll discover uh, these later in future episodes and review them in detail. Uh, and understand the, the mechanics of how this hypothalamic pituitary unit works for each of these individual systems. As you can see, there's a very rich blood supply. This is an interesting portal system in the body where arteries come in, they break up into capillaries, and these hormones from the hypothalamus are dumped into the median eminence, and these capillaries, through long and short portal vessels, carry those hormones to the pituitary, where the veins break up in another set of capillaries, uh, and the pituitary cells are bathed with these releasing hormones from the brain, and their hormone uh, output from the pituitary cells is affected. In this slide, you can see a schematic of the different nuclei in the hypothalamus. And again, these nuclei are the uh, collection of the cell bodies in the hypothalamus uh, that uh, have individual functions. So for example, there's paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei that are involved in the production of vasopressin that's transported along the pituitary stalk through axons to the posterior pituitary, where it's stored and then released when necessary to be able to affect our water balance and uh, control our fluid and electrolyte balance. Some of these nuclei uh, have these short little axons that dump hormone into the median eminence here, then carry their hormones down that portal system. Other nuclei are involved in other functions. For example, the hypothalamus regulates sleep uh, and wakefulness, uh, metabolism, and uh, controls body weight and also is involved in thermogenesis through its control of autonomic outflow, maintaining a body temperature when it drops and, and uh, producing sweating when necessary. So it's a very complex uh, part of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary unit. Uh, this is a neural structure and this uh, interaction between this nervous system tissue and the pituitary gland is what led, led to the designation of the field of neuroendocrinology. Next, we'll talk about the pituitary gland itself. This is a microscopic section through the pituitary gland. You can see that it's bean-shaped. This is part of the stalk in the upper part of the posterior pituitary. This is the adenohypophysis, or the anterior pituitary, which is the glandular part of this uh, particular organ. And it's composed of a number of different cells. This is an electron microscopic view of the cells of the pituitary gland. You can see the nuclei. All these little black dots are the secretory granules that 
or little packets of hormone, if you will, produced by the individual pituitary cells. I like to think of the pituitary gland as many glands rolled into one because there are multiple cell types. They come from several different lineages. The pituitary has stem cells that differentiate into early lineage cells, and, and we can actually track these cells through their development by looking at what we call transcription factors. There's a transcription factor called PIT1, which becomes cells that produce growth hormone, uh, prolactin, and thyroid hormone. The uh, SF1 cells become gonadotroph hormone producing cells such as LH and FSH. And then uh, the uh, T-PIT cells become ACTH producing cells. And we can trace these back several generations before the final pituitary gland cell has been uh, produced uh, through the embryogenesis, if you will, or the maturation of those particular stem cells. The pituitary gland does have stem cells. I've seen patients who recover pituitary function after years of being hypopituitarism, and I think it's an activation of this early progenitor process that leads to a repopulation of the pituitary gland uh, over time. Pituitary hormones are secreted in a pulsatile fashion, uh, and uh, this is an example of uh, growth hormone secretion. The top panel is in uh, man and the bottom panel is in a woman. A couple important things is that to know is that most of our pituitary hormones are secreted in pulses and the pulses vary from 8 to 12 a day, sometimes 14 to 16, sometimes they're greater when you're younger and growing. Uh, this example shows growth hormone secretion usually is secreted at night. Most of the growth hormone that an adult makes is secreted at nighttime while we're sleeping. You can see there are a few pulses here during the daytime uh, but by and large, if you, if you look at the literature, 50% of adults would have an undetectable level uh, during the daytime when their blood is drawn. That's because most of it's secreted at night. Same is true of women. This is a little bit more pulsatility in a, in a woman during the daytime, and I'm not sure why that's the case. Probably has something to do with estrogen uh, feedback on this particular system. But the point is, is that these hormones are pulsatile, and when we check a laboratory test, we may catch a a hormone at the peak of a pulse or when it's quiescent. So that's one of the reasons that we'll talk about later where you can see pituitary hormone levels vary uh, such that your growth hormone might be undetectable one time and three the next. It's because we're catching it on a pulse or in between pulses. This particular slide shows you the uh, diurnal rhythm of ACTH uh, and cortisol secretion. Uh, this doesn't really illustrate the pulsatility of ACTH as I would like it to. It's more of a general scheme of ACTH production and cortisol secretion. In this uh, situation, the hormone is secreted mostly in a diurnal variation related to the sleep-wake cycle. So you can see here that uh, levels of cortisol are low uh, at night when we're sleeping and they start to rise before we awaken and reached their peak probably around eight to nine o'clock in the morning for people in a normal sleep-wake cycle. And then those levels will fall throughout the day to again be low uh, prior to bedtime. This is called a diurnal variation. The previous example I gave you of growth hormone is what's called a nictohemeral variation. And interestingly, the PIT1 lineage cells, prolactin, growth hormone, and thyroid hormone, all secrete most of their hormone at night while we're sleeping. Cortisol is diurnal or circadian, so it's secreted uh, related to the sleep-wake cycle. Its activity is decreased when the lights are out and increased when the lights are on. I use this slide as an example uh, to explain that all of the pituitary hormones are produced by the cell related to gene, uh, gene transcription, and you get a principal hormone production. In the case of ACTH, it's POMC, pro-opio-melanocortin. This is the, the backbone molecule for ACTH. And then there are a couple of different enzymes. There's a PC1, a PC2, and actually a PC3, I believe, as well, involved in the modification of this original protein to get pro-ACTH and beta-lipotropin. Beta-lipotropin's cleave to one of the endorphins, so we make endogenous endorphins and lipotropin. The pro-ACTH molecule can become ACTH and also alpha-melanocyte-stimulating hormone. This process of taking a primary protein and modifying it is common in all body tissues, but especially with these hormones, 
where uh, they are all changed and transformed to get to a final product that can be secreted into the bloodstream when it's needed for one reason or another. Uh, interestingly, um, this process can be disturbed in patients with pituitary disease and you can produce an inactive hormone. It can be measured in the bloodstream by radioimmunoassay, but it doesn't have any function. And that can affect pituitary function and we will talk more about that uh, in a moment. This next slide illustrates the concept of negative feedback, which is very important when we're trying to understand pituitary disease. Uh, the, the best example I can give is the thermostat in your home. It's a sensor, just as the pituitary and the hypothalamus are sensors. And in this situation, the sensor is sensing the room temperature and it's making alterations in your heating or air conditioning units based on need. So you can see that if, you know, if, the, if the, the sensor detects that the temperature is too hot, it's going to turn off the furnace or turn on the air conditioning, whichever season of the year is and which unit you need to work. So that effector uh, is going to then decrease the temperature, restore the desired temperature. It's going to keep monitoring. If it gets too hot because the uh, air conditioner shuts off when the temperature is reached, it'll turn it back on. Same thing is true of the furnace. If, uh, if the heat drops, it's too cold, it's going to turn on the furnace. When the furnace brings the temperature up, the furnace is going to turn off. The sensor is going to have done that. It's also going to tell it when it's time to turn back on. Negative feedback in the pituitary is very similar, and that's why I show this slide first. So, for example, let's go back to our hypothalamic pituitary unit. As we talked about, the hypothalamus makes a releasing hormone that affects anterior pituitary function. Usually, it stimulates, but as you'll learn later in future episodes, it can also inhibit pituitary function. The pituitary gland makes a trophic hormone, whether it's ACTH or TSH or LH and FSH or whichever one, that acts on a peripheral endocrine gland. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of ACTH, it acts on the adrenal gland. In the case of TCH, TSH, it acts on the thyroid gland. That hormone is secreted in the bloodstream where it goes on to do a number of different things. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happens is that hormone in the bloodstream is measured by the pituitary and by the hypothalamus, and in some cases other organ tissues as well that influence this system. But it usually shuts down, just as the thermostat would. So the, the pituitary increases a hormone, that hormone feeds back and stops the pituitary from telling the body to make too much, stops the brain or the hypothalamus from telling the pituitary to make too much. In some cases, the pituitary hormone itself regulates the hypothalamic production. And of course, at the top here, there are lots of other different factors like stress, for example, that can activate this system or different medications that can shut it down or the body can sense when it's time to shut it down and to control it so that when you're sick, for example, you're gonna shut down your thyroid functions a bit. When you're sick, you may activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal function. So this system is designed very carefully to uh, result in a, a uh, process of what we call homeostasis, sort of maintenance of our health, if you will, and helping our bodies interact with our environment and change hormone levels when needed to accomplish certain things so that we can survive uh, as uh, living organisms. Well, in closing, I want to say that disease of the hypothalamic pituitary unit can affect any one of these sites. You can have disease of the hypothalamus or disease of the pituitary stalk that uh, interferes with the delivery of hypothalamic hormones to the pituitary or pituitary disease itself. And of course, it's well known that people can have disease of their peripheral glands, the pituitary, the thyroid, or whatever, and that can be reflected in how the pituitary and the hypothalamus respond to those, as we'll talk about in future episodes. Thanks for tuning in, and stay tuned for additional episodes of Pituitary 101. This is Jorge Facinetti, co-founder and chairman. Pituitary World News is dedicated to produce content that informs and educates. We are a nonprofit organization and as such rely on contributions to fund all these initiatives. We have exciting plans for 2025. If you'd like to learn more about our plans and help, please visit pituitaryworldnews.org and click on the donate button. Every contribution helps, no matter the size. 
You can also help by sharing all the information available on the Pituitary World News website at pituitaryworldnews.org. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Thank you, and thank you very much for watching.